Okay, welcome to your exam review. This will cover chapters 16 through 18 where we're going to talk about thermodynamics, a rate law or kinetics, and then finally equilibrium. So we're going to try to review all of that and my guess is this will take at least two parts um, to complete. So uh, watch as much as you think you need to until you feel comfortable with this information. If you understand what I'm about to go over with you on this video, you should be able to understand the questions that are asked on the exam. If you don't understand what happens on this review sheet, then that means you're not prepared for the exam and you need to get yourself prepared. So you can review previous videos, and you can review homework, you can review class notes, all sorts of things you can do. You can even, heaven forbid, pull out that textbook and work some of the example problems there. So here we go. We're going to start talking a little bit about entropy. And if you remember, um, the entropy values increase when you go from a solid to a liquid to a gas. So gases have a higher degree of entropy than liquids, and liquids have a higher degree of entropy um, than solids. Now, one other thing I want to add, which, you know, I'm probably not going to ask on the exam, but I'm going to throw it in on the review because it's pretty easy, and that is if you have two substances in the same phase, then you look at their molecular weights, and it turns out that the higher the molecular weight, or the molecular mass, if you will, the greater the entropy. So if all things are the same, the substance with the greater molecular weight will have the higher degree of entropy. Now, let's take a look at these examples here for number one. Um, which of the following pairs of samples has the higher entropy? Bromine liquid or bromine gas? Well, let's see. Gases have a higher degree of entropy than do liquids. Their degree of disorder increases. So bromine gas would be the one I would circle for 1A. How about 1B? We have two gases to worry about here. So they're in the same phase. I'm going to pick the one with the larger molecular weight. So C3H8 is a larger molecule than C2H6. There are more arrangements for that molecule that are possible, so it has a greater degree of disorder than the smaller molecule. MgO, solid, or NaCl, solid. Once again, these are both solids. So once again, I would compare their molecular weights. And I know that sodium chloride has a molecular weight oh, of about 58.5 grams per mole. Magnesium oxide, oh, it's about 40 grams per mole. So we're going to go with sodium chloride. And how about this one? What if we have a solid form, and then we take that solid and dissolve it in water? Now when potassium hydroxide dissolves in water, remember it dissociates into ions. So we have K plus and OH minus ions floating around in water. Won't those be more disordered than a solid crystal? Crystals really have a low entropy. Things dissolved in water will have a higher degree of entropy. So I'm going to pick potassium hydroxide in that example. Okay, so remember, entropy will increase when you change phases from solid to liquid to gas. Gases have the highest degree of entropy. Also, those molecules with a greater molecular weight have a higher degree of entropy than those with a smaller molecular weight. Okay, let's try another example. Let's predict the entropy change for the following processes. So we're going to choose from either a positive entropy change, so triangle S, delta S, is change in entropy. So a positive entropy change, meaning it gets more disordered. Negative, or for this example, we're going to put a question mark, meaning uh, we need a little bit more information before we're able to determine that. So here we go. 2A. We have uh, one mole of gas on this side, and we have two moles of gas on this side. So this is oxygen atoms. This is molecular oxygen. Two moles of gas would have a greater disorder than one mole of gas. So I would say the delta S for this reaction would be positive. Let's take a look at the second one. Same thing. 2 moles of ozone gas to 3 moles of oxygen gas. Once again, I have 3 moles of oxygen on this side, 3 gases, as opposed to only 2. So I would predict letter B would have a higher entropy, um, would have an entropy increase, excuse me. Letter C, we have uh, 
three moles of gases on this side, one methane and two moles of oxygen gas, so three on the reactant side and three on the product side, water vapor and carbon dioxide. So the number of moles of gases are the same. I think I need a little bit more information to decide that, so I'm going to put a question mark there. Now we could look up some entropy values of these and determine that for sure, but we're going to say we're unsure, we need a bit more info for that. Now by the way, as we do these, please pause, it might be a good idea, and you try to do them by yourselves, and then go back and check your answers and see how well you're doing. It's, uh, it can it build your confidence if you're getting them right, and if you're getting them wrong, please pay careful attention as to my reasoning. Or maybe go back and review your notes. How about a solid versus that same solid AQ, meaning it's dissolved in water? Yeah, it's going to be a positive entropy change. How about liquid ethanol to vapor ethanol or gaseous ethanol, a liquid to a gas? That's going to be a positive entropy change. And finally, letter F, we have these things dissolved in water and they come together to form a precipitate, a solid. So we have a lot of disorder here and a lot of order here. So entropy is decreasing on letter F. Okay? Alrighty. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation. Let's see if I can fit it in up here. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Remember that equation? Remember, if delta G is negative, it means the reaction is spontaneous. If delta G turns out to be positive, it means the reaction is not spontaneous. So, on number three, what I want you to do is determine which of the following reactions are spontaneous at any temperature, which are never spontaneous regardless of the temperature, which are spontaneous only when the temperature is high, and which are spontaneous when the temperature is low. So, let's take example letter A. You can see that the delta H is negative and the delta S is positive. Let's just plug those values in my equation. We have a negative delta H, right? And that will eventually equal our delta G, won't it? We're going to subtract T delta S. Now my delta S is positive, so I'm going to put a positive in here. Now we need to do a little bit of elementary school arithmetic here. What happens if I have a negative number and I subtract a positive number from it? Yeah, whether it's big or small, it doesn't make a difference. If you're subtracting a positive from a negative, it's going to make it more negative. So it turns out it doesn't make a difference if the temperature is a big temperature or a small temperature. I'll still be subtracting a positive number. And therefore, delta G will always be negative, which means it's spontaneous. So letter A will always be spontaneous, and it doesn't make a difference what the temperature is. Let's take a look at letter B. We have a negative delta H and a negative delta S. Let's plug that in. Our delta H is negative. Now think about our riding the bike analogy. Isn't going downhill spontaneous? Yeah, we sort of like that so far. Minus T delta S. Now delta S, that's my sock drawer analogy. Here it's becoming less disordered, which is a strange way of saying more ordered, which is not spontaneous. So we have my delta H saying this is spontaneous, and my delta S that's saying, wait a minute, no it's not. So this one's going to be temperature dependent. Let's think about this. If I subtract a tiny negative number, meaning my temperature is low, that's like adding a tiny positive number. Right? Subtracting a negative is like adding a positive. So if I'm subtracting a tiny po or subtract subtracting a tiny negative or adding a tiny positive, that means my temperature is low. That means delta G could still be negative. Now that's going to be at low temps. So low temp we would expect this reaction to be spontaneous. Think about the math. As temperature gets bigger, Let's say this is a thousand Kelvin. Now we have a big negative number we're subtracting. That's like adding a big positive. And that could change that to a positive delta G. So at high temperatures it would not be spontaneous, but at low temperatures it is. So this guy here would be spontaneous at 
oh, you guys can't see it, spontaneous at low temperatures. Let's look at letter C. Positive, positive. Hmm, you probably know where this is headed. The last one was negative, negative, right? So if this is positive, positive, um, this must be high temperature spontaneity. Now well, we can play with the math a little bit if you want. If I subtract a tiny positive number, meaning the temperature is low, um, delta G could still be positive. But if I subtract a really, really big positive number, right at high temperatures, that means delta G could switch to negative and be spontaneous. So letter C is spontaneous at high temperatures. Letter D we've already done. Negative, positive. Negative, positive. I'm not going to explain that again. That one is always spontaneous. And then finally, letter uh, E. Positive delta H and negative delta S. Let's think about that for a minute. Positive delta S means we're adding energy. My bicyclist is going uphill. That's not spontaneous. A negative delta S means, we means we're becoming less disordered or more ordered. That's not spontaneous. So neither of these processes are spontaneous. That means at any temperature, this will be non-spontaneous. Okay, so always non-spontaneous for letter E. All right, let's do number four. Wish my printer wasn't going on right now. Sorry for the background noise. Let's take a look at number four. Under which set of conditions is a chemical reaction most likely to be spontaneous? Now this would be a great place to pause the projector, or to pause your video. And to go back and review this here, what we just did, in our Gibbs-Helmholtz equation, and try to answer this without my help. So pause it now and give it a try. Okay. If you chose letter A, it's the best answer for number four. Let me show you why. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. If delta H is negative, right? And I'll be subtracting a negative number because my delta S is negative. If that temperature is really tiny, aren't I subtracting a small negative number, which is like adding a small positive? And if it's small enough, delta G will still be negative. So, so long as that temperature is low, then it would be spontaneous. Okay, we're going to wrap up part one for now, and we'll continue with question five uh, with part two. Hope you're enjoying the review so far.